Good evening, and welcome to the 2024 Great Decisions Series, co-sponsored by Mead Public Library and the Sheboygan Branch of the American Association of University Women, an organization dedicated to empowering women and girls through equity, advocacy, education, and research. We do not endorse candidates, but we do take positions on issues, especially women's and education issues. We sponsor candidate forms for the nonpartisan elections in April for the mayor, the city council, and the Sheboygan School Board. Locally, we give scholarships every year to non-traditional women students. We usually give three scholarships every year. I wish you could hear their stories. Very compelling. And then in the fall, for the seventh year, we will be conducting a STEM workshop for sixth to ninth grade girls to encourage them to consider careers in science, technology, engineering, and math. Great Decisions is a product of the Foreign Policy Association, which also publishes a book with information about eight timely topics. They make that information available to anybody throughout the United States. They prepare a book, which is available for purchase and also for reference here at the library. They also do a DVD, I think, on their information. So we are indebted to the work of Mead librarian Aubrey Lau for her work in arranging the schedule for this evening. So the topic for tonight is U.S.-China trade policy, and it will be presented by Judd Kinsley. Judd is Associate Chair, Professor of History at UW-Madison. He earned his PhD at the University of California, San Diego in 2012. He is a historian of modern China and particularly interested in the ways that natural resources define and often limit state power in Chinese border regions. His book, Natural Resources and the New Frontier, offers a perspective on the development of institutions of state power and authority in China's far western providence. He has published articles on gold mining, roads, and geological surveys. He teaches courses about the history of modern China and America in China. He received the Fulbright Hayes Doctoral Dissertation Research Award in 2009. Please welcome Judd Kinsley. Thank you. Thanks very much for the, the really warm introduction. And I, I was really happy to learn more me, about the uh, AAUW, which I wasn't familiar with in the past. And so I'm really happy to learn more about it, particularly as someone who has a, a nine-year-old daughter. So I think a lot of those kinds of programs are ones that are you know, quite, quite meaningful. Um, and I'm really happy to hear that AAUW is sponsoring these kinds of programs. And I also want to thank the Mead, Mead Library for, for organizing this, this series that, that I'm a part of. It's a real pleasure to be here um, in Sheboygan. It's my, I think I've driven through town, but I haven't spent any meaningful time here. It's just a nice opportunity to be able to check out a different part of Wisconsin. Usually I'm kind of going through Sheboygan on the way up to Point Beach Park or somewhere farther north. And so I'm really happy to, to get a chance to check out your really lovely city in, in really lovely weather. Um, today. So, so thanks so much for, for having me. And I'm really happy to be here. Um, I am, uh, as you guys, as everyone heard, uh, a professor of modern Chinese history at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, and my work is, is primarily these days, I, I have focused on natural resources, Chinese state power. I've done a lot of work on Chinese borderlands in the past. A lot of my research today is on U.S.-China relations, particularly in the 1940s. Uh, I'm really interested in U.S.-China economic relations during World War II, something I'm happy to talk your ear off about if you have any interest in that. But I, I have a book coming out on that subject in the, next, in the next year or so, and so hopefully I can get a chance to come back and talk about some of that here. But today, I'll be talking about something, something different, a little bit more ripped from the headlines than World War II history. Um, and this, 
again, is kind of the perspective of a, of a historian, right? I'm not a political scientist, I'm not a policymaker, I'm not an economist. Um, but this is the material that I'll be presenting today is really thinking about China and its relationship to the United States today. Um, but really, you know, in, in thinking about this through a kind of a policy perspective. And to, I think, present the subject in a kind of a balanced, what I see to be relatively moderate way, ways that we can sort of analyze and think about the U.S.-China relationship today. I think there's a lot of sort of heated rhetoric around China, around the United States, and I'm searching, I think, in this talk today to find ways to, to maybe think about this thing in sort of a, uh, an even-handed, sort of even-keeled way. So that's my mission today, I, should, uh, I suppose. Um, so in terms of just to give you a kind of a, a roadmap for the talk, these are sort of the key points today. Um, I'll start by asking the question, is China a business opportunity? I'll give away the answer. I think it, the answer is yes. Um, is China a security threat? Answer, also yes. Um, and finally, I'll conclude with two points. You know, what should be done about it and what should not be done about it in thinking about these two categories um, first. And so um, I think I'll probably talk around 40 minutes or so. Um, if you do have questions after comments on this subject or anything related to modern China, I'm happy to chat about it. Before I get too far into things, is everyone okay with the sound amplification? Everyone in the back? Everyone sounds okay? Great. Um, so first, to dig into it, get right, right into things, is China a business opportunity? Again, I think that the answer here is yes. Two main points that I'll, that I'll focus on. The first is that you know, gains from trade with China are very, very real. And I think it's worth it for us to point to this. Um, and we can see this through a concept that economists call comparative advantage. And I'm not going to dig into a lot of economics terms here. I'm not an economist. And I'm not that familiar with them. But I think that this term in particular is helpful for us in understanding why we can see China in some ways as being a business opportunity. Um, so all countries can gain, and the idea of comparative advantage is that all countries can gain from trade by specializing. So if you're better at making cars, then you should make more cars, right? Um, anytime you're not making ca cars, then you are paying an opportunity cost for not doing that, right? That's sort of the most simplistic way of thinking about this concept. Um, and what this means in practice is that no matter how different they are, countries can gain from trading with one another. One country produces certain things, another one consumes them. This is sort of the way kind of integrated economies start to develop. So how does this work then in the context of China? Um, namely, I mean, China traditionally has had much lower labor costs for various reasons. Um, one of which is that China invested initially in labor-intensive manufacturing. I mean, this really shouldn't be news to anyone, right? I mean, many of the things that we buy in Walmart today are made in China, right? And that's because things are cheap. Labor is cheap. And the infrastructure connecting sites of production with transport hubs are well-developed in the Chinese context. Um, so China's labor is cheap. That's, we can put that on the table. But that doesn't mean that China can outcompete the US. And I think that's an important point to emphasize. Um, China cannot outcompete out the US in all sectors. I mean, labor really is only one input. And in many ways, the United States has a comparative advantage um, over China in many other sectors. And I just want to highlight a couple of sectors that, you know, that the United States has a comparative advantage over China in. Um, the first one is American agriculture. I mean, air, American agriculture dominates the globe, right? And China is a net importer of food. So much of, which, m much of this food comes in from the United States. Education is another sector that is dominated by the United States. Um, we tend not to think about education as an export, but I think we should. Um, over 350,000 students study in the United States every year coming in from China. Another sector that the United States can outcompete China on our financial services. And so I guess I'll probably ask what I think is almost certainly a rhetorical question. Um, do any of you have Chinese credit cards? I'm, I'm, guessing, I'm guessing no. Um, and that's because American credit cards and banking services dominate. Visa and MasterCard continue to dominate China's credit card market. 
Um, these American companies have significant leverage over the Chinese markets. And I think you get some window onto what that leverage can look like when we think about what happens to um, holders of Visa and MasterCards in Russia after the Ukraine, uh, the Ukraine war. There's a significant amount of leverage that U.S. Uh, financial industries have. So here's a, an image you can get some sense for the Huaren Yinhang, so the China bank and the Visa, Visa logo very prominently displayed. The other sector that, is, that the United States can outcompete China in is technology. Um, you know, many of you almost certainly have not used a Chinese operating system. Windows, Mac, Android dominate our, our markets, dominate the market in the United States and also dominate the market in China. Um, so recently, the United States has become very worried about the security threats posed by Chinese hardware. But the Chinese themselves, and the government in particular, really worries about the threat posed by American software. 85% of Chinese desktops use Windows operating systems, and very few use a Chinese-developed version of Linux. And so again, this is sort of a technology that the United States has come to dominate. So the larger point here is that the United States actually competes very well with China in many sectors. And this has really benefited the American consumer. And I, I just want to, there's another example of this. I want, I want to talk about another um, one specific case. Again, I think anyone could recognize this. This is an older version of the iPhone, obviously. But I want to think about the iPhone, the construction of the iPhone, to give you some example for how kind of integrated economies work. So the construction of the iPhone itself is really only possible in an integrated global economy. It's a result of American competitive advantage in design and research and development and Chinese competitive advantage in manufacturing. So you have this sort of blending there of these two different competitive advantages. So it was designed in the United States using the talent ecosystems of Silicon Valley. Um, but without Chinese manufacturing, this couldn't have become a commodity product. You know, economists estimate that an American-made iPhone would cost nearly $3,000 just because of the high cost of labor. Um, so maybe some people might buy it, but this would be a highly niche product, right? Cutting edge, but largely out of reach. And I think the same, you know, thinking about the iPhone, in the case of the iPhone, this kind of integration of U.S. research and design, um, U.S. talent and developing technology, and Chinese manufacturing systems can be said that that sort of integration is something that we see across industries in, in the technology sphere. Tablets, personnel, com personal computers would have remained niche products without this level of integration, without kind of worldwide supply chains that bring the ultimate cost of these things down so all kind of consumers in the United States can ultimately purchase them. So many of these manufacturing systems ran through China at one point or another. So thinking about some of this, I mean, there's been... It's worth it for us to understand that there are tangible gains from trade with China, right? Um, you can think about that in the context of the cost of, of iPhones. Um, but it's also, so, so in terms of kind of lower, lower prices. Um, but this has resulted in lower prices across the board in many cases. So after China entered the WTO in 2001, Chinese ex exports to the United States increased rapidly. And it's during this period that many of the products that you find relatively inexpensively in places like Walmart um, are, are made in China. But they drove down, this sort of integration with China drove prices down for many goods across the United States. And price drops have a real impact on U.S. consumers, equaling around, according to some estimates from economists, around $1,500 of purchasing power per year for every American household. Um, and this purchasing power, we should add, you know, disproportionately has benefited those at the kind of lower end um, of the income range, people who spend more of their income on basic necessities. So the, the larger point here is that trade with China has allowed Americans to live materially better lives, even as wages, I should add, are, have been largely stagnant in the United States. I think one other point that I think is just worth considering, I don't want to spend too much time with it, but um, this discussion about kind of the benefits of an integrated economic system. Also, you know, I think we also should include sort of the, you know, the, the impact that this has had on China itself. And so I think it's worth pointing to the fact that this level of integration, particularly after 2001, lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty in China as well. Um, 
Not all of this is because of trade. We should make clear about that. A lot of that is because of Chinese liberalizing of their own economy, but a lot of it is. And so I think from a human perspective, it's worth putting that on the table. Okay. So that's sort of the, the good news part of the story, I suppose. But I, I don't want to be Pollyanna-ish about this, because there are costs to this integrated economic system. We should be clear about that. And what it costs, as far as the United States is concerned, is jobs. I mean, economists debate extensively about just how many jobs have been lost potentially through t trade with China. Some argue that trade has had no net impact on jobs whatsoever, as manufacturing jobs have been replaced with service jobs. And many of these economists argue that it is automation that kills manufacturing much more than trade. And one small kind of data point in that is that the U.S. has more manufacturing output today than it had in 2000 with a smaller number of workers. So that suggests that manufacturing still exists, but there's a higher level of automation. And much of that is what's driving people out of the workforce. But most economists do agree that jobs have been lost to trade. Um, so since... Uh, 1980, the U.S. has lost 7.5 million manufacturing jobs. This is, this is data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Um, I mean, this cannot, and I, I should add that this should not be fully blamed on trade and trade with China. These declines started well before China entered the WTO, the World Trade Organization, in 2001, so 20 years before. So the BLS, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, believes that are around Perhaps, and these are all estimates, 1.2 million jobs were lost because of trade with China, um, and many others were lost because of trade to other countries, including Mexico and Canada. Um, some of these economists have pointed out that these job losses we do experience have been offset by gains in purchasing power. Um, so for every job lost, according to some economic estimates, um, every job lost in the United States they gained $400,000 of purchasing power. And this is a good deal when you consider that many of the jobs lost were around $40,000 a year. But still, I think what's important to recognize is that there is a big problem here. And so while maybe on the aggregate, the overall sort of impact economically has been positive, the gains are not spread equally, right? These lo losses, in many cases, are concentrated in specific communities. And so we can see the devastation of these communities that were dependent on specific industries, ultimately that are impacted by, uh, by changes in the larger global economy. And so this creates pockets of poverty and frustration in many places across the U.S., and particularly, I think, here in the Midwest. And so this is something that we're really grappling with. Um, so while an additional $1,500 in purchasing power is good, that's only good for those who have jobs, right? So it's worth, worth kind of understanding the, the sort of costs here. Even if on the aggregate, you know, economists can say, oh, things are looking great. I think in, for many people, they don't experience it in quite that same way. So you see this kind of disconnect sometimes. I mean, there is some good news in this. I mean, there are ways that you can address some of these problems, um, these impacts to local communities and to local industries. Um, there is sort of a... Uh, something in, in, that economists call trade adjustment assistance. So certain programs that are, implement, are implemented by the U.S. government and other governments around the world that aid workers whose jobs are lost to trade. Um, so this often involves short-term wage insurance, enhanced access to unemployment, support for training programs to gain new, new skills. But the problem is that American TAA policies, trade adjustment assistance, are woefully inadequate. So if we can see sort of the amounts that the United States is spending on some of these kinds of programs compared to some of our um, competitor countries. So the United States spends less on this than most developed countries. In many cases, American programs are also poorly designed. They're created in tandem with free trade agreements. So workers who are displaced by NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, received assistance, while workers displaced by trade with China did not, because there is no free trade agreement in place. So this is a huge oversight. And it's also worth noting that many of these tra training programs are quite stingy on retraining, make it quite difficult um, to retrain workers. Um, so while trade with China has benefited Americans on the whole, we've done little to help those who are, who are most, most affected. Um, I think we could, could impact them, could, sh could 
sort of ease some of these problems through trade adjustment assistance programs and also through investments uh, in growing capacity uh, in infrastructure and other programs that could kind of point the way towards new industries uh, in the future. So this is a, a policy pro uh, problem in many ways, right? Um, the optics of jobs lost to trade should be clear are, are bad. Um, and it's a, pro it's a social problem that we grapple with. And protectionism in many ways, sort of efforts to sort of push larger tariffs and to protect US industries are easier to sell because they appeal more to the emotion of the loss, right? Um, and are typically pitched as low or no cost solutions. When in some ways we should be clear that many of these protectionist policies actually drive up prices and increase sort of the, the burden on, on the American consumer. Um, the TAA solution, trade adjustment assistance solution, is also less appealing to the emotions, right? Protectionism, sort of getting back China for having impacted US, US industries. Um, there's something that's sort of satisfying about many of these kinds of policies. Something like TAA, trade adjustment assistance, is something that requires policy support and a willingness to spend resources on these kinds of programs. And this is something that can be difficult in today's era of political gridlock. Um, and the problem that we're faced with is that protectionism, you know, increased tariffs or blanket tariffs will not bring more than a fraction of these jobs back. Many of these jobs were not lost to trade, but to automation. American firms are not going back to labor intensive manufacturing. And the jobs, jobs brought back by protectionism come at a staggering cost to the American consumer. That is, if they bring back any jobs at all. Um, so ultimately, economists have suggested that Various protectionist policies, you know, since the mid 2010s, have led to net losses of manufacturing jobs. Um, so jobs that have been created, perhaps through protectionist policies in the steel industry, led to job losses in industries that are dependent on steel shipments. So things like automotive industry. So tariffs. Um, in 2020, some estimates suggested that tariffs had cost Michigan 55,000 jobs, mostly in the automotive sector, and cost Ohio 26,000 jobs. So to conclude this section here, is China a business opportunity? As I already gave away the answer here, yes. Are there gains from trade? Yes. Are there costs from trade? Yes. Do the gains outweigh the costs? Maybe, right? Um, but are we expanding trade? No. Um, and one of the reasons we're not doing that is because a belief that China is a national security threat. And I think this is something that's worth addressing very directly. So I want to address this question of China as a security threat. Because again, given away the answer, I've already said yes. I'll make that case here now. I mean, I think that when, we're, when, when I and you know, um, political scientists, individuals focused on, on policy, think about kind of China as a threat, the most kind of concerning potential flashpoint in this US-China relations are focused on Taiwan. And Taiwan is almost this most likely to lead the United States and the People's Republic into conflict. There's no really very little question about that. So very brief kind of background on the Taiwan, uh, Taiwan flashpoint. Um, again, I'm a historian, so I could give you plenty of background, but I'll probably hold off on, on too much. Happy to talk about it in Q&A if people are interested. Um, but the, the People's Republic views Taiwan, seen here, the small island here off the coast, as a breakaway province. Um, and it became a province when the previous government of China fled to Taiwan after the Chinese Revolution in 1949. Um, Chinese government today believes that the status of Taiwan is a purely internal matter and that foreign countries should not be involved, while many in Taiwan believe that, Chi that Taiwan is an autonomous state, if not completely independent. In the 1970s, the United States and the PRC came to the People's Republic, came to understanding about Taiwan that was vague and somewhat contradictory. And this was known as the One China policy that was uh, crafted by Henry Kissinger um, and R Richard Nixon, who was president in 1972, 1971, 1972. And the One China policy effectively agreed that Taiwan was an integral part of China um, and was not an independent state. In the official American position is the status of Taiwan is undetermined. Um, the United States pledged to support a peaceful reunification of the People's Republic and Taiwan, but largely the United States government has sought to protect the status quo in order to make sure that we don't have 
war in the Taiwan Strait. And this has worked fairly well um, since the early 1970s, but it's currently under strain. Until the 2000s, China didn't really possess the military or naval power to invade or to seriously threaten Taiwan, but now they do. China's seen a significant naval expansion uh, in, in the last few years. Its military budgets are not fully transparent, but they have grown in terms of constant dollars. They're consistently around 2% of GDP, which has not really changed much in the last few years, but it's also worth noting that this is lower than uh, American spending on, on the military, which is typically between 3 and 4%. So here are some statistics on uh, military spending. And you can see sort of the gradual rise in, in China's, um, uh, China's spending on the military. So the Chinese Navy today, I mean, there's been a lot of headlines about this, outnumbers the U.S. in terms of numbers of ships, the number of hulls. Um, but comparing the U.S. and China is pretty tricky. The United States has a global security presence, right? While the Ch Chinese security focus tends to be more regional. So while the U.S. could not devote all of its resources to East Asia, China could, because most of its Navy is operating in the Indo-Pacific region. China also doesn't really have concrete allies that can, that can shoulder some of the security burden. So while it shares interests with Russia and North Korea, they're not necessarily allies. The U.S. does have allies in the region, Taiwan, Japan, Australia, South Korea, and others, which the U.S. can effectively lean on in the event of any sort of security uh, problem in, in the region. But I think what all of this kind of points to is the situation is dangerous right now. Um, this is because of Chinese ambitions, but it's also because of U.S. politicians taking various symbolic actions that are largely performative, that have only provoked China in really meaningful ways. Um, and this has happened on both sides of the aisle. 2022, Nancy Pelosi visited, uh, then House Speaker Nancy Pelosi visited Taiwan, um, which prompted China to take military, undertake military exercises around Taiwan during the visit. And so you get a sense here of how kind of China was operating in response to some of these provocations. I'd say that or, um, policymakers tend to discount the idea of an invasion of Taiwan in the near term, but it's not impossible. Um, and a much more likely scenario would be an embargo of the island. And I think you get a sense for how that might look based on where these live fire exercises are happening around Taiwan. Um, the question, I think, is how would the U.S. respond to Chinese provocations? And that's not entirely clear, because a lot of that almost certainly depends on the president in charge. Would that president attempt to lift the blockade of Taiwan? Would that lifting of that blockade lead to war? Would allies join the war with the United States if the U.S. strikes first? All of these are open questions that we don't have a solution, a solution for. All of this is to sort of point to the fact that this is sort of a, an open national security problem the United States is grappling with. So that's one side of this kind of issue of China as a security threat. The other element of this that's worth talking about when we're addressing whether or not China is a security threat is China's growth itself threatening to the United States, China's economic growth, or its diplomatic growth, its effort to engage with countries throughout the region. Is China trying to replace the United States as being sort of the central pillar in a larger global system? It is clear that China is expanding its economic and diplomatic interests around the world. Is this just a natural development, or is it specifically targeting the United States? I mean, these are all, again, open questions. One case to think about that has pointed some, has prompted some to, to consider whether or not the United States or whether China is trying to supplant the U.S. globally is a program that was put in place by Chinese President Xi Jinping uh, called the Belt and Road Initiative, which you can get some kind of amorphous sense here for its global scope, um, in which China is investing really at unprecedented levels in infrastructure programs in many bordering countries of China and beyond into Africa and the Middle East. In theory, some suggest that these investments might bind developing countries closer to China through through a strategy called debt trap diplomacy to essentially give large loans to these countries and using the kind of inability to pay back those loans as leverage for China to set up military installations or ports 
or certain kinds of other economic advantages in these regions. It's not clear if that's what's actually happening here. But it is clear that there is a certain amount of Chinese interest in expanding its footprint outside of, of East Asia to some, to some extent. So relatedly, related to this question of Chinese expansion, is Chinese technological development itself, itself a threat to the United States? So China is investing heavily in technologies that many believe will define power in the next few, few decades, whether it's AI, green technologies, surveillance technologies, 5G, many of, there's a substantial amount of investment from Chinese institutions in these new technologies. How do we evaluate this behavior? I mean, some view this as a Chinese attempt to dominate these industries. Others view it as an attempt to limit Chinese dependence on foreign products. In reality, it's probably a bit of both. It's important to note, I think, that some of China's growth when it comes to technology uh, and economic development is uh, undertaken through non-competitive means. Um, just a couple of examples. There are a number of cases of Chinese firms stealing into US intellectual property. That has happened. Several cases of people passing on or stealing trade secrets, both Chinese citizens and American and European citizens as well. China also has a history of making access to IP a condition on entering the China market. And so this has led to a certain amount of that IP, uh, intellectual property, being circulated outside of these places. This has harmed American companies. The other element of this, the state, the, the Chinese government does help Chinese companies. Many Chinese firms, Chinese companies, are state-owned or state-backed. And this gives them, in many cases, an unfair advantage in home markets and possibly abroad. But in some ways, I think these are less tangible threats than the Taiwan threat. The danger to Taiwan is clear, and the Chinese capabilities there are clear. We know that China wants to be integrated. This is a central pillar of Chinese Communist Party policy. And they're probably willing to pay a high price at some point um, to make this happen. On the other hand, replacing the US may or may not be a central policy of the United States. And China's interests in many ways are largely regional. Most of their most aggressive policies are directed toward shoring up power in Asia through island building and threatening policy toward neighbors like the Philippines or Vietnam. But like all countries, China would like to maximize the amount of power and influence at the smallest cost possible. And so many of these policies, I think, can be seen in that context. Um, all right. So I think I've hopefully laid out the risks a little bit, the risks and the rewards, potentially, of this China relationship. So now I want to turn you know, to the last part of the talk here. What should be done? One thing that's worth considering, I think, is reconsidering you know, blanket protectionist policies or the role of role of large-scale blanket tariffs. I mean, there's little support from economists that sort of the idea of a trade war has been a successful strategy when it comes to American interests. There are real costs. This costs hundreds of thousands of American jobs. It's raised costs for consumers. And it hasn't, we should note, shrunk the US trade deficit with China. And it hasn't brought back manufacturing jobs. And here, it's worth noting that I'm not fully blaming either political party here. Um, in fact, many of the issues of the China threat, and particularly related to sort of economic sanctions and tariffs, are something that are shared across both political parties. Recently, there's been news about what's called a Washington consensus on both sides of the political aisle and sort of using China um, as, a, uh, as a political foil to push forward for new policies and to gain larger, kind of larger support. Um, so while Republicans tend to talk more about across the board tariffs, Democrats also advocate for tariffs, but more, tend to be more targeted ones. So the emotional power of protectionist rhetoric has made it a powerful political weapon for both sides. And it's difficult to urge against it. There's very little space for that in today's politics. So that's the first. Second. And I think this is really critically important here. The United States should further work with allies around the globe. This is critical um, in dealing with the very real threats of China as far as security is concerned. The world is increasingly alarmed by Xi Jinping's tenure in Chinese policies, particularly toward East Asia. Get some sense for that. The unfavorable views of China have been you know, jumping up since the early 2000s really substantially. This is not just unique to, to countries in the region. One more here. 
This is something that's happening really across the board, right? The U.S. can work with these countries and these partners to counter threats from China. Um, there are new efforts to coordinate militarily with allies in, in the Pacific region, various kind of agreements with Australia, uh, the United Kingdom, uh, to integrate submarine fleets, uh, which could ease the sort of the security burden. Um, but this co cooperation with regional partners should be expanded and deepened as a real response um, to what is very much a, a real threat. But the response should also not be simply confined to the military, military cooperation. The United States should work together with partners in the region um, to form new kinds of trade agreements. So Chinese malfeasance in many ways is a threat to American business, whether it's through stealing of IP or whether it's through state kind of support for Chinese firms. Um, so it's a threat in many ways to American economic security. And other countries, as you can see from these graphs, recognize this. The U.S., for partisan political reasons, has largely refused to take collective action, operating collectively with its allies. And this was most clearly demonstrated with the U.S. withdrawal from the Trans-Pacific Partnership in 2017. And there's an inability or an unwillingness in many cases to replace that with anything meaningful. So the Trans-Pacific Partnership Pact went ahead anyway, even without U.S. support, and the countries of the Indo-Pacific still want the U.S. to join to operate in a free trade zone with, with the United States. So together with these countries in the region, the US can create a modern free trade area in the Pacific. It can write, write the rules of trade in ways that will force China to reform. And this is critically important because one of the central narratives that many Chinese in the Chinese Communist Party and in the Chinese government believe is that the United States is determined to thwart China's rise. But US membership in collective uh, collective institutions sends a message that this is a much broader sort of effort to work with partners to, to resist kind of Chinese malfeasance, uh, both economically and politically. So if China wants to be a part of this economic community, U.S. collective action could force it to play and abide by a set of common rules. And so this is something that's worth considering. In sum, we should prioritize collective action and responses, working very closely with allies um, and shoring up kind of connections with regional partners. The problem is that these cost money and political will. But I think it's worth pointing out that this is not charity. Um, it's an investment in the structures that will create an equal playing field and also will reduce the economic and military threats that China poses to the region. Um, OK. Finally, sorry to keep going on. Hopefully, everyone's still, still with me. Um, we're wrapping things up, I, I promise, and then, then I'll open things. So what should not be done? So I have some bullet points here. Um, and the first one, we shouldn't lose our minds over China. In many ways, it's a regional threat, with Taiwan being the most likely flashpoint. It's not an existential threat to our own safety, right? And regarding Taiwan, the American position on Taiwan is, the American position is principled. American policymakers should be making every effort to prevent a conflict. Um, and we should know, also importantly, what we're going to do in case of a less than invasion attack on Taiwan and embargo, right? But I think what's really important to kind of reiterate what I just said is that to address this regional threat, we really must work regionally with our partners in the region. And this will allow us to respond collectively, to maintain a strong united front against Chinese aggression, whether it's in the Taiwan Strait or the South China Sea. Um, to shore up kind of China, American alliances um, and to resist sort of the Chinese threats with hopefully by you know, holding off any kind of um, uh, any flashpoint in the region. So we need to abide by our commitments to these partners, including Taiwan, to keep Chinese aggression in the region in check. And I think the other thing, we also need to be sober and clear headed about Chinese business competition. It is true, and I'm I don't want to shy away from the fact that some Chinese firms have violated international trade rules, they stole intellectual property, received state subsidies. And while all this is true, this isn't the whole story behind Chinese success. The truth is that many Chinese firms have out-competed American ones. We need to accept that and to do better. So we also need to support American workers and their communities, whether it's through trade adjustment assistance, or through investments in new industries or infrastructures that will allow us to develop um, industries that are 
kind of conforming to a, a new uh, changing global economy. So we need to do this with rhetoric, not with rhetoric, but with dollars and policies that support our workers. And we must not exaggerate the threat. We need to think critically about the conclusions we jump to regarding China's intentions, to think about the things China's doing that are grabbing headlines. There's a number of things that appear you know, rel regularly in the news media. I think it's worth it for us to think how different are Chinese actions in many ways than sort of US actions economically. Um, there's a number of cases we can talk about that in the Q&A if people are interested. But I think that it's also important, and this is something I, I teach in my classes a lot, um, for us to, you know, to operate with a bit of, I call it because they're history classes, historical sympathy, to think about what motivations are driving the actors in China. We don't have to agree with their perspective, but at least to sympathize and to understand why they're taking their actions and why their actions might be logical. We need to occasionally imagine what the world looks like from the Chinese point of view so we don't risk overreaction, right? and undertake policies that are counterproductive to American interests. But it also helps realize the limits of Chinese power and allow us to react intelligently in a way that helps the United States. And finally, this is where I want to sum up, uh, I think that we shouldn't compromise our values. Um, there's several values, I think, that are critical for the United States, and it's worth it for us to, to hold those dear and to use those as our own kind of lodestar in thinking about policies with China or with other future global threats. And we should be careful when it comes to attempting to exclude China from various types of technology or to close it out of certain industries. Um, it's worth it for us to think very carefully about the context through which we might close China out of a given industry. Um, we don't share certain, certain technologies with China, nuclear submarine technology. Um, other types of technologies that might have a use for Chinese, the Chinese military. But not all. We shouldn't kind of blanketly close China out of, out of these various industries. Semiconductors do not necessarily meet these above qualifications. Semiconductors are critical for any number of technologies, and closing China out from the larger global semiconductor industry creates problems that in many ways could lead to f future conflict. Um, I think that in general, we need to have faith in our own system, faith in our values, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, freedom of the press, you know, rotation in offices, checks and balances, because in some ways, these are really the fundamental technologies of the United States. You know, the United States is not perfect. These values aren't perfect. But one challenge we face is that democracies often act more slowly than authoritarian states. And this can give authoritarian states like China um, a short-term advantage. But in the long run, democratic governments make better decisions. They have more legitimacy. They're more agile through collective action and negotiation. So we shouldn't mirror China's bad behavior. But we must believe in the long run, we'll win any competition with China that's fair. Um, if we believe the competition is unfair, we should build a consensus, work with our allies to create the structures that will you know, create incentives for China to act more fairly and to operate within this larger global system. Um, and we should continue supporting, as connected to this, continue supporting a rules-based international order, um, support that with, uh, with our own resources and, and our own means. Um, and we should be addressing China, Chinese behavior not as a bilateral engagement to sort of just have negotiations with Xi Jinping, but again, to make it multilateral. Bring China into a larger discussion with many of our allies who share many of our, many of our values. And given this, if we do some of this, I think, then we'll win this competition. You know, we can continue to gain from China and address, address the security threats that, that China possesses. And I'll, I'll leave things there. Th thanks very much for your attention. I was, I was wondering about um, what was the partnership that you talked about earlier that the U.S. Uh, left in 2017? Mm -hmm. What was that? What was the the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And and why did we leave that? Well, Do you know why? Uh, yeah, I, I have a sense. Okay. Um, <laughs> I don't want to point. Watch out. I don't. I don't want to get myself in trouble here. But no. But it's um, no. But, I, but the Trump administration was very clear about this. That they they believed that the United States was not served well by these foreign trade, these these free trade agreements. Whether it's NAFTA. I mean, Trump campaigned on NAFTA, right? Against NAFTA. Um, and there was a belief that, in many ways, the TPP was something quite similar. Um, and so these, 
uh, engines of collective security, whether it's economic security or trade security, are something that, that Trump and certain, that President Trump and people within the certain groups within the Republican Party have real issue with. And you see them, see many of these individuals talking about NATO today, right? There's a lot of concern that the United States is is not being well served by these kinds of agreements. And you know, it's worth it for us to have that discussion, right? At the same time, recognizing there's a value in some of these kinds of agreements. And I think that we've paid a price for leaving the TPP. Um, so it's worth it for us to engage with it. And I, and I will say that it's not, again, it's not a fully a Republican versus Democrat. There are plenty of Republicans who are you know, sharp advocates for free trade, um, but the sort of more you know, Trump side of the Republican, um, Republican Party is one that has been much more skeptical of that. And again, this is something that's really playing out in, in real time today. Could you bring up, could you bring up your roads and maps slide? Sure. This one? Yes, I, my question is, what are the Chinese doing in Rotterdam? Yeah, well, the, what they're doing there, I mean, and what I should say is, is that these kinds of maps, in many cases, are ones that are being produced by the Chinese Communist Party. This one, not, this was a reprint of you know, various material that are being produced by the Chinese Communist Party, talking about the larger vision, Xi Jinping's vision for what China's role will be. But there are efforts to sign bilateral agreements with all of the countries that are on, along these routes in order to give Chinese sort of uh, the Chinese advantages in terms of circulation of, of goods that are coming out of the port at Rotterdam, for example. So it's those, the blue, the purplish lines or purple reddish lines mm -hmm. are ocean or sea. Right. And the blue are land. That's where the idea of the belt and road, the belt oh, is sort of a maritime belt and the road is an overland road. But I should say, I mean, these are not, these lines don't reflect specific Chinese on the ground investments. What that's they, my question. Okay, no, so, sorry if that's misleading. And that's the problem with a lot of this literature is that we're dealing with a conceptual vision from how, for how Xi Jinping wants to think about the world and China's place within it. When in fact, it's not necessarily an accurate reflection of how those investments are actually played out. In many cases, there are these points that there are significant amounts of investment. There's several places in Africa where they are investing in port cities and certain kinds of infrastructure, infrastructure in Africa and in Southeast Asia. But again, this map in many ways is misleading and can be used also in some ways as you know, propaganda for, China, for Xi Jinping's own vision about what China is doing. Um, so in some ways, I didn't do it intentionally, but this is, again, sort of propagating certain elements of Chinese propaganda that it's worth it for us to be critical about. So, so thanks very much for, for asking that question. What do you think is the, um, the level of danger from the very aggressive tactics that the Chinese are using in the South China Sea? Ramming ships, you know, barricading and building military installations on those archipelagos. Sure. Um, you see it pretty regularly that they're getting more and more aggressive. I just wondered Absolutely. what your take was on that. I think it is, it is risky, what's, what's happening. Um, as you say, there's various you know, spraying fishing boats with high-powered hoses, right? Um, there's cases of sort of physical, of fishing, you know, fishing boat crews being put in really direct danger by Chinese Coast Guard vessels, island building campaigns, efforts to build um, runways on small uninhabited islands that previously had been claimed by the Philippines or by, uh, by Vietnam. So it is a real flashpoint. And I think this is another case in which the United States would benefit from more leadership and kind of engagement with its partners. There is some of that, but I think to increase that would mitigate some of that danger to operate collectively. But I do think it is a danger. Um, I think Taiwan is a different sort of case because Taiwan has a collective security agreement with the United States. And so effectively, the United States is bound in some, in some ways to come to Taiwan's defense. And so that's a much more direct potential threat of war with the United States. Taiwan is what makes me nervous. That, those other things, I think, ratchet up the tension in ways that could very well lead to, f to further actions in a place like Taiwan. So I think it's part of one 
sort of set of problems that are emerging in the South China Sea and in the Taiwan Strait that I think can't fully be solved by um, collective security agreements. I think they also need to be solved through our own kind of military development and engagement with militaries in the region. Um, but it is, I mean, it, it is a major potential flashpoint. Again, I think it's, I see less of a da direct danger for the United States as far as war is concerned in South China Sea operations, but I think it increases tension in ways that could very well lead to other kinds of flashpoints. Since we're rather on the issue of the nine-line map that uh, uh, Xi Jinping is talking about, that goes way back, hundreds of years, thousands of years. And so to me, when you ask about what is their aspiration, he wants to go back through China's long and well-documented history to find a maximum extent of power that they had. And that shows in that, and it also shows in their current desire to name the next Dalai Lama, because sure. the Tang Dynasty did that what, a thousand years ago. Sure. And that's just not fair. You know, the Tang Dynasty, they were Buddhists. The communists are atheists. Sure. And for them to take control of a major world religion is really bizarre. Yeah. Just as bizarre as a nine-line uh, ocean um, I would, sea. I would say it's older than the Tang Dynasty as well. I mean, some of these, this has been, you know, Tibetan, um, the choice of the leadership of the Tibetan religion um, is one that was, had never been, the, the Qing dynasty was the most closely allied with Tibet, but still the Qing dynasty had no authority over the selection of the next Dalai Lama. So I think that, I think that you're right, and I think that we're getting back into, into history, which I appreciate as a historian, um, but I think that this is a really important part of a larger kind of narrative about Chinese history, which is not necessarily to reclaim historic territories, but, but to sort of assert a certain amount of global prominence for a, a new and form, reformed China. And that's, I'll say, again, to get, not to get too deep into the history here, but China has long been kind of scarred by its 19th century engagement with you know, British gunships in the Opium War, various fights with France, um, Britain, kind of the scramble for concessions, e efforts by the imperial powers to dominate China. In many ways, I think what the Chinese Communist Party is trying to do is to roll, roll that back and to put that, push that into the past, to assert a new and powerful China that can assert itself in ways that it was not able to do in the 19th century, but to look back toward an earlier model, whether it's the Tang Dynasty or something else, but at least toward the 18th century at sort of the apogee of sort of imperial power in the region, when it was asserting control not only of Ch far, far western China and Xinjiang, but into areas that are now Kazakhstan. Um, they had significant amounts of authority and not direct control, but into Southeast Asia. You know, they had a significant amount of influence, various islands off the, off the China coast, um, influence and sort of power in engaging with, you know, internal groups like, like Tibet or Muslims in the far west. And so I think you, you're right. You're onto something, I think, in thinking about this. Um, how far back we want to take that, or how sort of large we want to take that, I think is, is an important question. But I think that idea of the Chinese Communist Party is turning the page from Chinese weakness. I mean, this idea of China being weak, China is the sick man of Asia, is um, it's not that old. You know, this is really a 19th, early 20th century thing, but the Chinese Communist Party is saying that's in the past. We are on a new and sort of glorious track. And I think that's really what Xi Jinping sees as his legacy being. You know, turning the page fundamentally from that sort of moment of Chinese it history. It seems like a desire for world domination, though. Possibly. You don't see much evidence that they, I, I think right now they're focused regionally, I would say, whether or not they want to see this as a global, if we want to talk about it from a historical perspective, then there's not much evidence of China you know, imposing itself globally, um, certainly imposed itself regionally. Down the road, I mean, who, who knows? I mean, I think. One, one step at a time as far as the Chinese Communist Party is concerned. Thanks. I, I heard you near the beginning of your talk just in passing mention uh, education. And, uh, and I think I heard the number 350,000 uh, 350, students. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, it, do we see that in Wisconsin? You know, it's been a while since I've been on a college campus, but like at, at UW-Madison, is there a significant number of Chinese students there? And what, what is the impact of having, you know, that, that large number of students from one country sure. uh, being here in the United States? Yeah. 
I mean, there are a significant number of Chinese students uh, on the UW-Madison campus. I think they remain the largest single group, uh, national group on, on campus. I, I don't think there's, I'm, I'm almost positive that's, that's still the case. Um, I mean, I don't, it's hard to say on, on impact. Um, I mean, on the very direct sort of dollars and cents impact, I mean, Chinese students are paying full freight for their tuition. Um, there's no way for them to pay in-state tuitions. They're paying substantially more than, you know, my son, if he goes to UW-Madison, will pay. Um, so I think that that's part of this. And I think that that sort of Chinese students are an important, um, as far as the university is concerned, making sure the Chinese students and, and international students in general are coming is an important kind of financial strategy, and particularly as sort of the overall support from the state has gone down. The reliance on tuition has been impor quite important, um, and much of that is also international students. But I do think, I mean, my class is, well, maybe I'll, I'll personalize it because it's hard for me to say like what the larger impact is, but, and I don't think this is particularly representative either since I teach classes on modern Chinese history. Um, so maybe other, my, my colleagues might be better positioned to answer this question than me. Um, but I probably have maybe 20% Chinese students who will take my classes. I don't think that my colleagues have similar numbers. Um, but I'll say for me, I think it's quite valuable to have those students in my class. And not just from some sort of like uh, hand-holding, like having people around is always great. I think what they really provide for the students from Wisconsin is a really sort of direct sort of engagement with Chinese history. So for those students who are, you know, there's always students who kind of sit in the back and don't pay attention to lecture or don't engage in, in discussions. I think we can think of some of those, who those students are. Um, but for those students who do engage, the Chinese students who engage, they really bring something quite, quite unique to the classroom, especially for many of these students in Wisconsin who don't necessarily have that much engagement with China. Um, so to get sort of different perspectives um, in thinking about you know, global politics, thinking about the nature of the Chinese Communist Party, thinking about the Chinese Revolution. To me, it's quite valuable. I, I can't speak much more beyond that, um, but I do think that they, at least for my classes, um, they, they do you know, bring interesting perspectives and, and, and different views. I just have a question. How does the, the tariff actually work uh, you know, let's say an American company wants to buy something from China, $1,000, for example. The tax is added onto that. Is the government, our government, adding the tax on and then the company has to pay that? Yes. So. And ultimately, that almost certainly will be passed along to consumers. And that's the argument from economists about this idea that these tariffs are not costless, right? These are things we tend to talk about them as being low cost and sort of a solution that is, is one that's better than some of these other ones which cost resources, but this is one that we impose on the producer. It's not the case. Those things will be passed on to American consumers, almost certainly. Someone else? Oh, sorry. Going back to your map um, of the... Going back to the map of the trade um, adjustments, you know, for the G8 countries that you had. Okay. With trade? Uh, with the incentives, you know, like. Uh, um, uh, this one? Yes. Okay. Um, for the market adjustments and where the United States is, what do you see would be, where would the incentive to raise that adjustment for the U.S. labor market most likely come from? Would it small business, corporations, unions? I mean, where, do you see that growth? I mean, I would see it as positive and maybe taking some of the, you know, sting out of what you hear, oh, we're losing our jobs, you know, right. to the Chinese. But when you compare it to France, and look where we are, and the other, well, that's not all G8 countries, but you can see compared to those countries, I mean, I guess I want more of an explanation than then, like if there's, what would the viable solution to that be? Well, that's, yeah, that's a million dollar question. I don't, I <laughs> I'm think, sorry. I think that's, uh, I'm sorry. It just I think that's like, above my pay grade, but yeah. it's, uh, it just seemed like somebody, 
Oh, no. Did you, did you want to respond to that? If somebody else could. Yeah, my, my take on that is for the past six or seven years, our main problem with the labor market is not enough workers. Okay. So worrying about, you know, how many, go drive around, how many hiring signs do you see? So that's not an issue for us that's at this not, time. Okay. I right. just, it was just, a, a, you know, I saw that and thought, that's right. we don't need curious. It. We don't need it. We need more workers. Okay. In 2014, I mean, in, it, this is a different, a different, a different moment. And I, I imagine, I mean, most, many of these policies in these other places are ones that are state-funded programs, okay. um, funded often with certain types of, of taxes imposed on, on businesses. Um, that tends to be how these types of programs are funded. How, in practice, given our political gridlock in the United States today, how that would happen, how we would boost that number, what, if, if it was necessary, um, that's a different, I, I don't know. Like I said, that, that's what makes it a, a thorny question, is that the politics of spending our, our resources um, is often so fraught, I think. And so the question of where that money sh can and should come from, it's, it's, difficult, it's difficult to say. I'd like to say it's easy, but I, I don't think it is. Going back to your point about exaggeration, um, I come from an agricultural family background. And last week, I was reading one of their national magazines and concerned there about land being purchased by the Chinese. So the question is, um, is this a real concern? I mean, I, um, I always think fake news, that's, which is why I'm so glad you are here, right? Um, is it a real concern? And if it is, uh, what do we do about it? You pointed out that, yes, we export a lot of food to China, which supports our agricultural uh, prices. But what if they're buying up all of this land? Sure. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't have a good answer for it. I'm sorry. Uh, I know that people on my campus are working on that and have talked about it. My understanding from brief sort of hallway conversations is that this is an exaggerated threat. It, it is happening to some extent on the margins, but, but ultimately it isn't the kinds of threat that it is being held up to be, is, is my sense. Again, uh, I would love to know more about it. Now, I wish I had read that report that my colleague was, was working on before coming here. <laughs> um, that's, let that be, be a lesson to me. Um, but my sense is that you know, the, the takeaway point is that it is exaggerated. I, I don't know if I'd call it fake news, um, but my understanding is that it's, it's exaggerated. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Back to Dulce. I, I'm not into social media, but I keep hearing about TikTok. What can you tell us about TikTok? and how it impacts America. Sure. Um, well, yeah, how it impacts America, that's, a, that's a, another big big kind of question um, that you can look in different ways, I think. I mean, I once had a TikTok account, and I thought well, you can, it's easy to spend so much time on here as you ended up deleting it. But I think that, I mean, the problem, you know, I think that it's, it's a worthwhile discussion to have. But in many ways, I think the TikTok story is, is a broader problem that we have with, with social media. Um, namely, that even American-owned sort of social media companies in some ways have been captured at different points by foreign actors across the political spectrum, right? So it's not a TikTok, just because TikTok does have some connections to the Chinese government. All these things are being actively hashed out in court as we speak. Um, but the problems that we have with TikTok are ones that seem to me in many ways to be a larger problem of social media um, in dealing with the fact that we're giving so much of our information to these social media companies and it's not clear where that information is going or how it's being used. And that's something that's happening from American-based companies in, in California and across the United States. And so I think that these are issues that are related to China, but they're also issues of social media in general and our own engagement with it as U.S. citizens that are worth it for us to have a discussion about um, because we don't have the ability in many ways to protect our data from many of these companies like they do have in many other countries. And so I think this kind of question of TikTok in some ways is kind of a flashpoint um, because China's in the news a lot, but it's also a larger problem that we deal with with social media that's worth it for us to, to probably engage with um, much more directly. Okay. Other questions? 
Is the manufacture of computer chips on Taiwan a reason why you identify it as a flashpoint area? I know you've said we don't want to deny supercomputers to China. Semiconductors. But role, what role do those chip manufacturers take? Right. I mean, my, my sense is that the, the fact that many U.S. semiconductors are produced in Taiwan is not connected to China's own interest in Taiwan. China's interest in Taiwan is related in many ways back to its history that we mentioned before. I mean, China has identified Taiwan as a breakaway province. It's a seg effectively an ongoing civil war since 1949. Um, and there's an effort or a desire, sort of a fundamental pillar of the Chinese Communist Party to reintegrate Taiwan into the, the People's Republic. This is something, you know, this has been a central policy since, you know, Mao established the Chinese, uh, the People's Republic of China in 1949. Um, you know, the question of, of semiconductors, I mean, I don't, I'm not an expert um, on semiconductor industry or trade, but I think this, the, the point with semiconductors, unlike things like nuclear submarine technology, is that it's not particularly, um, it can be used for any number of different technology. Thousands of technologies use semiconductors. And so the idea, in many ways, the United States is going to so actively try to close off semiconductor, um, uh, semi, uh, the semiconductor industry to China in some ways causes long-term difficulties without much gain, is my sense for the, for the larger situation. But I don't think, to answer your, your direct question, there's not much of a connection between the semiconductor industry and Taiwan. Again, Taiwan produces many of the semiconductors in the United States. It's really a sort of a global hub for semiconductor industries. It's only sort of a, an added bonus, I guess, if, the China, if China is able to take Taiwan, that they can then have that technology, presumably. But I don't think the connection is that direct.